be on LBC, the Duchess of Cornwall. Stick with us on LBC for all the big names. And indeed, we've got a few more coming up in the next hour because it's nearly eight o'clock on a Wednesday, which means it's time for Cross Question, LBC's weekly political panel debate show, live from our new Westminster studio. Your chance to quiz our panel on the events of the week. Joining me in a moment are former Health Minister and Conservative MP Steve Bryan, the Labour leader in Scotland, Richard Leonard, broadcaster and former Health Minister Edwina Curry, and former homelessness star Dame Louise Casey. You can watch us on Global Player or via the LBC Twitter, YouTube and Facebook feeds and call us with your question on 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Prime Minister's warned the country is at a critical moment in the fight against coronavirus and threatened a second national lockdown. Hospital admissions and cases in intensive care are going up. So, at the latest Downing Street briefing, Boris Johnson called for a collective willingness to make sacrifices. I have to be clear that if the evidence requires it, we will not hesitate to take further measures that uh, would, I'm afraid, be more costly uh, than uh, the ones we put into effect now. It says more than 7,000 people have tested positive for the virus in the UK just in the last 24 hours. Another 71 people have died within four weeks of being diagnosed. While there has been an outbreak at a hospital in South Wales, eight have died, six more are in intensive care, with 82 cases identified at the Royal Glamorgan in Tlantrisant. Most surgeries are being cancelled and ambulances are being sent elsewhere. MPs have agreed to extend the government's emergency coronavirus powers by another six months. They have been promised to vote wherever possible moving forward, over potential new lockdown restrictions before they come into force. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 31 points at 58.66. The pound buys $1.29 and €1.10. And the weather tonight, some heavy rain clearing over England and Wales, but taking a bit longer for Scotland. Frost and fog patches in Northern Ireland, but we'll see a low of 1. Then tomorrow, sunny spells and scattered heavy showers with a high of 17 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Rachel Gerrish. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation Cross Question with Ian Dale. Hello, good evening and welcome to Cross Question, LBC's weekly political panel debate show. We'll be here in LBC's Westminster studio each Wednesday at 8pm on the dot to answer questions from you LBC listeners. And as well as listening to us on the radio, you can watch us on Global Player and on LBC's YouTube, Facebook and Twitter feeds. If you'd like to take part in the show and ask our panel a question, all you have to do is pick up the phone and dial 0345 6060 973. The lines are open now. All previous episodes of the programme are on the Cross Question podcast and this show will appear there before midnight or heads will roll. It's time to introduce our panel. In the studio with me and socially distanced as ever are the Conservative MP and for the former Health Minister Steve Bryan, Dame Louise Casey, the government's former homelessness czar who's just been appointed a crossbench peer. I'll have to practice my curtsy. And joining us from Scotland is the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Richard Leonard, and from Derbyshire, broadcaster and former Conservative MP Edwina Curry. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's from Nick in Putney. Hello, Nick. Hi there, Ian. Thanks for having me on. What so would you like to question, ask? My question is, what, as, a, as a DJ myself, what are you politicians going to do to save the events industry in this country? That's a really good question, isn't it? Because, of course, the events in... There are lots of industries that have been severely affected by coronavirus over the last six months, but for obvious reasons, the events industry has really been at the sharp end. Um, Steve Bryan, obviously the government has come up with lots of different packages for different sectors, but nothing so far specifically for the events sector. No, and it's a glaring omission. I mean, I sit on the digital culture media and sports select committee and we uh, have been making our voice heard on that because as soon as i heard the chancellor last thursday wasn't it uh, make this announcement i i heard him talk about job some jobs not being viable and you know of course th th there is every logic to understanding what he's saying there but you know the 
if you sorry to single it out but let's say you know you you work in Pret in the in the city of London there is no question that the number of workers in the city of London is going to change so I can see what he meant there and then the training package that followed but um, why are why are anything more than that not viable um, if a vaccine is on its way let's say a year's time let's say in the spring then there are plenty of jobs which are they're viable we're just not letting them be viable at the moment and the the arts the creative industries the events industry but, is but they've had a 1.57 billion pound bailout the arts they? have yes but, but the event sector the conference i used to run a conference organizing sector so i feel really a uh, yeah. company so i feel strongly about this they've had nothing and there is a difference exactly and the prime minister was asked at prime minister's questions today about this exact question from one of my colleagues jason mccartney and he came back with the answer around the art sector um and about the the 1.7 grant so uh, there is a gaping hole there and we can't pretend there isn't and uh, this sort of comes off the back of the self-employed income support scheme which was the self-employed equivalent of the furlough scheme for those who don't don't know and there were big emissions in that from people who were company directors or who hadn't been self-employed for a long enough period of time so they were new to these are the excluded three million they're the excluded three million and i would hazard a very good guess actually because a lot of them contacted me and my constituency that the people working the events industry fall into that because they are contractors who work project by project and uh, you know i've banged on about this so many times in parliament and so has the chair of the treasury select committee and so has our select committee and we're going to keep on banging on okay. about it um richard leonard let's come to you next what's the situation in scotland has the scottish government done anything different from the uk government on this well, it's, um, it's put some money into the arts as well and to the creative industries. But um, the problem we face is really this cliff edge at the end of October when the job retention scheme comes to an end. And so the, um, the proposed replacement scheme is only partial and uh, leaves out huge sectors of the economy which we know are vulnerable, including those critical parts of the nighttime economy. And, um, you know, I... I absolutely sympathise with Nick and lots of people who were out uh, demonstrating today that there is um, there is an important part of the economy which has been uh, completely overlooked and uh, whether that's because the Chancellor thinks these are uh, inverted commas unviable jobs or not there are lots and lots of people in lots and lots of key sectors of the economy from wedding organisation to nightclubs uh, uh, to live music venues in Edinburgh, of course, we didn't have a festival or a fringe festival this year, and that left a huge hole in not just the Edinburgh economy, but the whole Scottish economy. And there, there needs to be um, a proactive hole in my diary. intervention by government, which there clearly has not been. <laughs> Um, obviously, there are some sectors of the economy that shout rather more loudly than others. And we hear a lot from the event sector, the wedding wedding industry as well. Um, you must get representations all the time from, shall we say, less glamorous sectors of the economy and say, well, hang on a minute, what about us? And I, I'm thinking coach drivers. I, I constantly get coach drivers ringing me saying, look, yeah. there are loads of family firms that are going to go bust and we're not being listened to. Yeah, Ian, 100%. And... Uh, Coach companies uh, who were suddenly uh, thrown out of contracts to supply school runs, uh, who are part of the leisure industry and the tour and travel industry, are all in a pretty dire situation. And ironically, um, they could be and should be part of our kind of medium and long term future. And um, but it's also entire industries that are under threat from aviation, which we know uh, about through to um, industries which are hanging by a thread, but which have got a long-term future. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I was out at a factory in Falkirk, uh, which builds buses, and uh, all of their orders have dried up. Uh, and yet we know public transport provides green jobs and uh, is good for the long term uh, of both, both the economy and the environment. So there needs to be an understanding uh, that uh, a helping hand is needed in these key parts of the economy uh, so that we retain these jobs, we retain these skills and we retain the capacity because uh, there will be future demand in these areas and it's up to government, it seems to me, working with trade unions and businesses to find a life raft to get us through this. 
But Ian, can I just add though that it, I, it can't all just be about what what the government hands out in what is taxpayers' money. You know, you you can't pack loads of people into a theatre. But I think there is plenty of case to be made that the events industry, as in France and Germany, with a controlled environment, with with testing, with temperature checks, with social distancing. You know, if we can if we can fill restaurants socially distanced, I think we can make the events industry right. work. Too. And Edwin Curry, th this really all comes back to this tension between the health aspect of this and the economy. Uh, like Steve, you, you've been a, a health minister. Um, what would you be advising the government to do now to, to try and um, help these different sectors of the economy without actually prejudicing the nation's health? Well, uh, I think that's one of the tensions. And uh, bear in mind that one reason for us all behaving ourselves as far as coronavirus is concerned is because, in fact, most people die of other things. And we want to make sure that they are able to be looked after in the health service and that they feel uh, safe and secure in seeking treatment for you know, a heart attack or a stroke or diabetes or other issues. That actually matters a, a great deal. But, you know, Ian, I've not been on this programme before and I'm wondering how you want us to handle the questions. Do you want us just to keep saying how awful everything is? Um, no, I don't uh, at all. I want you to say what you want to say. All right. Well, let me, let me answer honestly. Um, even if you open up an exhibition, a big trade exhibition in somewhere like the Excel Centre. I know it's, it's been used for the Nightingale Hospital instead. But if you open it up, will people come? You're not going to get international travellers. Uh, you're not going to get most of your oh, old people who might come. So you're going to spend a fortune and it's all going to go money down the drain. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a saying if you have a good heart, and that is you cannot save all the puppies. You cannot save all the puppies. And there will be some activities that are not going to recover for quite a long time. Some will come back very quickly. I think theatres, for example, will come back as soon as uh, older people are vaccinated. The quicker we can get to the theatre, uh, the quicker we can have birthday parties and that sort of thing, the quicker m weddings can get going again, uh, the better. But some things will take longer. And much of the exhibition uh, industry and much, much of festivals, which take a year or more to organise, they will not get going quickly. They're not going to happen in the spring of next year. In which case, it does not make any kind of economic, fiscal or indeed political sense, in my view, to start throwing money at them. On the other hand, there are vacancies well, in... Well, then they go out of business. Well, then, then they'll go out of business. Then they'll go out of business. I mean, you have no, no right to expect that everybody else is going to keep you going just because you well, want to. It, it, in, nor work. in normal circumstances, I would agree with you, but these are not normal circumstances. These are perfectly viable businesses. It's not their fault that this pandemic has hit. Surely, if government is to do anything, it is... It is there to intervene in cases like this. And, it, OK, if a country is, if, if a company is not viable, I agree with you that there's no point in throwing public yeah, money at it. Not, but if it is viable... It's just not being allowed. Yeah, but well, it, it, it's not like a, a zoo, for example, where a few millions will keep it going. And that if you don't do it, then the animals will all die. It, uh, that's something that I would uh, actively support. I would love to see many of these activities continue, but they are not going to be viable for ages and that okay. makes no sense right. whatever, any kind Louise of economic Casey. I suppose where I think I uh, disagree with that is that there has to be a completely different way of looking at this. So the problem at the moment, I mean, just on the very specifics, you know, Nick has just raised the events industry. He's a DJ, a very good friend of mine, set up uh, Big Fish, Little Fish. It's gone absolutely gone it was it has just gone global about six 12 months ago and now and it's gone and i think the thing for me ian is um it's the inequity of so some industries get support some parts of the labor market get support some don't so arguably you know w what is the difference between a community big fish little fish type activity what, for parents with that? kids it's it's raves but right. mid-afternoon okay. for parents and their children. And a the, rave the, for parents a and rave kids? For parents I've never heard of that before. It, it, ghastly, it, no, uh, it's, you've it, told it, me it, something. I mean, I'm a disco person. See, Rich, Richard's up for person. it, I can yeah, tell. Yeah, yeah. If we was up for it, I mean, we're all up for it. Get with it, guys. We're all up for that. But basically, I think what's really interesting, though, is 
for somebody that's slightly outside, I'm not political in this way, I don't understand why some people are given help by this government and some well, people aren't. Well, because to govern is to choose. I mean, well, gov governments so take decisions and then they're held accountable for them. But that's in normal circumstances. We in are all looking circumstances, at, in, I would say. In which case, they need to look at, they need to be equal. And so what is the difference between keeping a theatre open and keeping big fish, little fish open? What's the difference? Why does one bit of the arts get support and another bit of the arts get support? The other thing to remember just specifically about this is actually the thing for me about all of this is where is the planning and um, Steve you said it a few, uh, right at the beginning of your question which is if we had some sense that there was a plan here where you know okay we don't get a vaccine till 18 months we don't mm. get a vaccine till 12 months we don't get a vaccine for mm. six months so what's the game plan mr government mm. really because actually in normal life that's how you have to organize things so we and we should be able to do that type yeah. of exercise and then think so how do we protect the people from going but, under and if we don't protect them in these circumstances the truth is they will end up on the dole queue where we will be then having loads and loads of people that are getting de-skilled out of work and not being able to find their way back in. I know what the this, game this plan is. The game plan is to suppress the virus until there's a vaccine, but they discuss the effectiveness thereof. Okay. Um, and we can. Well, let's bring Nick and Partly back into the conversation. You've heard from all four panellists there. Nick, what, what would you yeah. want the government to do? Well, um, first of all, I'd just like to say that some of the opinions I've just heard there are absolutely appalling. I mean, to, to, for someone to say, if, they, if these festivals and raids go under, they go under. That's just life. Sorry, the events industry, I'm, I'm talking about the night economy, is the mm. fifth largest economy in the UK. And all that's going to happen is if these um, events are, you know, if they do go under, it's just going to drive all the youth, all the young people into underground criminal raves like they were back in the in the 70s and 80s. And we're going to have a huge problem with, um, with a crime wave generating from these illegal events. The whole reason that we have these licensed, well-managed um, events and festivals is so that people can go into a safe environment and enjoy themselves. I mean, I, I, I completely appreciate the fact that we are in the pandemic, these are unprecedented times, but to think that, you know, to just offhand it's such a big, it's a bit, it'd be like saying, oh, if the restaurant industry goes under, it goes under, that's just life. It's mm. an enormous part of, of our tourism, our economy, our culture. We are known as one of the central hubs of the world because of our night economy. And to hear it brushed off like that, like it's nothing, is just staggering. Well, Edwina, I think Nick's really referring to your comments there. Do you want to respond? Well, that's why I asked you. Do you want us just to sound sympathetic or do you want us to be honest? Um, I would rather the money go towards the things that uh, Louise cares about. Uh, the people uh, in families, uh, the carers, the people who have all sorts of needs. And there are all sorts of other opportunities. One of the important things that Rishi Sunak has pointed out is if you keep people in zombie jobs, then they're not pursuing the other opportunities that are opening up. Uh, I'll give you two short anecdotes from people that I know. Um, the pilot for uh, Virgin Atlantic, for example, who has accepted that they're not going to be flying for a while, he's rejoined the RAF and he was told he could fly wherever he wanted, you know, how, however fast he wanted to go. He was in without any problems whatsoever. Um, and our friend who is a magician up in Warrington, who's really quite a character, a children's entertainer, got fed up being at home and he now works uh, for the refuse collection and he's having a wonderful time doing that he tells me he walks 11 miles a day and is much fitter than he's ever been in his life i'm well, making a serious that, that... point in i'm making a serious point here there yeah. are other jobs around with lots of vacancies and if the young people who work in the industry nick is talking about if they stay in that industry kicking their heels on public money then they ought to be encouraged to go and do the jobs that are available and that are, do really need doing. Richard, that's a really important point, isn't it? Because um, there may be people, particularly in the type of sectors that Nick's talking about, where effectively you, you've got to accept that you're going to have a year without any work. And so therefore you've got to go and do something else. And we talk about reskilling, retraining, upskilling. There are going to be a lot of people who have to downskill as well, aren't there? 
Well, I mean, I have to say that um, Ed Edwina sounds as though she's reliving her time in the 1980s, as though uh, well, mass we'll unemployment that, is somehow a price <laughs> worth paying. Because, um, I mean, really, this idea that people just get on their bike and they're part of some churn in the labour market and they'll find alternative work is not the reality. It won't be the reality for Nick and it's not the reality for hundreds of thousands of working women and men up and down the country. So, uh, look, I support uh, extra investment for things like social care. I think that there needs to be a huge revolution in how we provide care, especially with an ageing population. But the idea that somehow we can just allow between now and Christmas, because that's really what we're talking about, this the job retention scheme comes to an end at the end of October, so it's just a few weeks away, and there will be hundreds of thousands of people cast aside because of the termination of that scheme. Okay. And the scheme that was announced last week by the Chancellor goes nowhere near to providing the level of support that's required. And, uh, you know, some people may think unemployment on that scale is a price worth paying. Well, I happen to think that it's not. Oh, Richard. OK, Chris in Brighton says, as a socialist in the events industry who's lost all of his income to COVID, I agree wholeheartedly with Edwina. There's always one. Capitalism does not owe you a living. That's not how it works. It's galling to hear capitalist business people becoming socialist all of a sudden now that they're experiencing difficulties, demanding that the nanny state intervene on their behalf. They should have thought of that before the last election. Well, lots to get our teeth into there, but we're going to move on. 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to ask our panel a question. You're listening to Cross Question. It's 18 minutes past eight. This is LB. Trust Pilot. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 19 minutes past eight. Let me reintroduce my panel if you've just tuned in. Dame Louise Casey is here. Steve Bryan, Conservative MP for Winchester, former Health Minister. We have a second former Health Minister with us, Edwina Curry, who's speaking to us live from Derbyshire. And also Richard Leonard, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, is with us too. Let's go to our next question. It's from Jürgen in Ballam. Hello, Jürgen. Hi, Ian. Um, I would like to know, as a Scotsman who's been living in London for six years plus now, what the panel believe is the greatest threat to the continuation of the union? Big question. Um, Richard Leonard, let's come to you first for obvious reasons. <laughs> well, Jürgen, I think at the moment the biggest threat to the continuation of the United Kingdom is Boris Johnson because the way in which he is trying to drive through uh, a Brexit uh, no deal option, uh, the way that he is prepared through the internal uh, market legislation to set aside uh, devolution, which we've had for 21 years, uh, is really putting a huge strain uh, on the uh, future and ongoing relationship between the constituent how, how parts that, of the how UK. Is that threatening, how is that threatening devolution when a lot of the powers that are coming back from Brussels will go to the devolved governments? No, because the, the legislation as it's currently written, uh, by default, in the end, places everything 
in the hands of Westminster. And there is no, uh, there is no arbitration. There is no uh, 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 kind of third party court to go to to try to resolve any disputes. It basically says, in the end, uh, Westminster and Whitehall will decide as though devolution uh, had never happened. So we want to see um, uh, cooperation between governments. We want to see, in the wake of the repatriation of powers uh, with Brexit, we want to see a lot more co-determination uh, between the governments. I mean, there have been some flickerings of that in the Four Nations approach to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but uh, there's been nothing like uh, the level of cooperation uh, that we need uh, in the future. And, and that's important when it comes to things like, you know, how we handle any trade agreements with the United States or uh, the EU, for example, in the future. There need, you know, there needs to be an understanding that um, uh, things like food standards, uh, agriculture are devolved uh, and therefore agreements that are entered into really need uh, the cooperation and uh, the broad support of uh, the devolved parts of the UK, especially when it comes to those areas of policy and um, uh, and governmental decision making, which are devolved. So, so Boris Johnson poses a huge threat. Um, he's also made comments in the past which are very derogatory about people in Scotland, uh, which doesn't uh, serve his cause uh, terribly well either. Uh, but I think that there is, um, you know, th there will be pressure uh, if there, you know, if there is a, a laissez-faire market-based approach to the economy over the next few months, which sees uh, this huge spike in unemployment, that will also create uh, additional strain and stress uh, on the union. And that's before we even get into uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol and the willingness to breach international okay. law, which is part of the Brexit approach of Boris Johnson's government as well. I'm going, to, I'm going to be deliberately provocative now and say that some people reckon that the Scottish Labour Party are the biggest danger to the future of the union because you've effectively ceded the left to the SNP over the last 10 years. Um, you, you have an equivocal position, it seems, on whether there should be another referendum. I, I read that this the Labour Party is now showing a bit of ankle to the SNP in terms of having a second referendum uh, in in the future. Can you just clear that up? What what is the position of the Scottish Labour Party, and is it the same as Sir Keir Starmer's position? Well, the, the position of the Scottish Labour Party is that uh, we will be going into next year's Scottish Parliament election. Uh, with a clear position of opposition to a second independence referendum because we think the priority of the next Scottish government and the next Scottish Parliament has got to be about sorting out the public health crisis we face. It's got to be about uh, resolving these big questions around uh, what's happened to the economy, uh, not least this huge rise in unemployment and uh, the expected uh, rise in youth unemployment especially. Uh, how we rebuild our public okay, services, well, well, including, let's not have a list. including let's the not national have a health list. These let's will be the priori list. people's priorities. Okay. They are Labour's priorities in Scotland, Ian. Are there any circumstances which the Scottish Labour Party would support a second referendum on devolution? Say, for example, the SNP get an overall majority and it's in their manifesto that they want a second referendum. In those circumstances, surely they would have a right to demand one. Well, Ian, you're asking me as the leader of the Scottish Labour Party to concede an election which is eight months well, you're away. you're not going to win it, are you? To do that. I'm not prepared to do that. We're, we're, I mean, you might come second, but you're not going to win it. And, and win every seat that we can. Well, I, I would expect you to say that, but realistically, and if you were putting a political pundit's hat on as opposed to the hat of the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, you would accept that you're not going to win the elections next year. It is it is politically impossible for you to do that. You might come second. That's the best you can hope for. Well, but but, but if you forgive me, your, the premise of your question is that the SNP will have an overall majority after next May's elections. Mm. I do not accept that at all. OK. All right. Louise Casey. Is this something you feel strongly about? Um, well, I feel very strongly that um, if I was living in Scotland and looking down here at the current government's in, out, in, out, shake it all about, incompetent handling of COVID, I would look to Nicola Sturgeon daily but, but and think, figures, well, actually... The figures actually in Scotland in many ways are worse than in England, in care yeah, home deaths, in infections at the moment. Absolutely, but she's not pretending they're anything other than that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, an, I'm not an SNP. <laughs> I don't want... Well, I think it's about trust and confidence in who's leading you through difficult times. And, you know, seriously, right now, I don't feel a huge amount of trust and confidence 
in the government to lead me and all of the people that I care about in terms of social policy through these difficult times. I find it... Is that why you stepped down as homelessness, sir? That you just didn't feel confidence in, in Well, we'd the done people. what we needed to do okay. at that stage, and I felt that it was time... I'd, I'd never went back to be the homelessness czar. You know, Gen, Robert Jenrick did the right thing, and we got everybody in, but I then felt it was time for them okay. to press on, basically. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's what comes back to my earlier question to, 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 to Nick, actually, which is... I, I just want somebody to manage some of this. It's like I can I can take difficult messages about about the virus. I can I can even take difficult messages about the previous handling of of the virus. That you know maybe people didn't know it was going to sweep through care homes in the way that it did, but we should know now. The same way you know in the week before A level results and O level GCSE results coming out, why is it the night before that everybody's having running around the place? It sort of doesn't exactly. Inspire inspire me with confidence and I think when all is said and done you know it's difficult to point this out to everybody but though feelings are very high on Brexit things are really high on Covid it's affecting every single human being's life in the planet and so when you look at somebody that looks vaguely dishevelled who can't answer questions I worry for him don't talk about Steve like that <laughs> you know and I worry for <laughs> it and I am and not I am not you know you know, I really don't want Scotland to leave the union. I really, really don't. I'm gut gut wrenched that the fact the Labour Party has lost complete control of Scotland and, you know, God love you, it's not gonna work out next year with all Rosie up in Scotland for Labour. And so essentially we're ceding power to a nationalist party that at the moment looks and sounds like the best minister uh, on this particular virus and you know she sounds honest she looks honest i think she is honest and you know she's whereas actually we were having the medics tell us what to do now we're not having the medics tell us what to do we're you know it, it frightens me that people just aren't you know and in a way i think where's the civil service on some of this as well it's like it's not just ministers. Mm. Um, okay. It doesn't feel organised to me, and that's that's the gift. Incompetence is not something any government should get themselves into. Edwina Curry, what do you think is the biggest threat to the union? Going going back to Jürgen's question. Mm. Well, there there are two answers to this. Uh, what's the uh, greatest threat to the continued continuation of the union? Uh, obviously, Nicola Sturgeon is. And um, she is very good indeed at her job. Uh, in that respect, I agree with... Uh, uh, with Louise, it doesn't follow that what she wants is in the interests of the people of Scotland Indeed. or of the rest of the country. Uh, and in fact, I think it would be a big, big, big mistake uh, for my uh, Scottish relatives to go floating off into the North Sea. Um, the Currys and Macdonalds of the Clan Ranald, you know, my granddaughter and oh I go running around Ireland. Oh I, should, should, I tell, should I tell you, Edwina, that I'm a Campbell? <laughs> Right, I can try to remember who won that one. <laughs> I think we did. I think we did. <laughs> then, 250 years ago. Uh, there we go. Uh, but, no, the, I think the more serious uh, answer is, the greatest threat is if people in England lose interest. And that is a real threat. The, the Conservative Party can easily lose interest because um, if the seats in Scotland are no longer in Parliament, then we'd have an even bigger majority. And that's a real worry for the Labour Party and Richard in Scotland because without any seats that's in why Scotland, they're showing without any hope of winning any seats in Scotland, mm. they cannot become a government with a majority uh, in the United Kingdom in the foreseeable future. But I'm in the north of England, um, and what we find up here is a degree of envy of Scotland's position, because mm. for a very long time, to keep the Scots happy, lots of money has gone mm. from Westminster to Edinburgh, right? Billions and billions every year. And it's gone whizzing over the heads of people in the north of England. And what we find here is that people's living standards are lower than they are in much of Scotland. Um, the kids have to uh, pay fees to go to university and colleges uh, in so many ways. You know, the industries have uh, have died in some of these old uh, towns and have not been replaced. The education level is not such as to put kids into the new industries like IT uh, and so on. There are jobs for IT going at fifty, sixty thousand pounds a year in Manchester, going begging because the local schools cannot provide the kids to do them. So something's wrong there. 
Okay. And so the north of England doesn't give a toss about Scotland. Now, that's probably putting it a bit more broadly. Um, a lot of the north of England would like more attention. Well, I did, I did ask you to be honest, so <laughs> you, you, you fulfilled that task. Say what you think, um, let, let's, let's go is. to... I absolutely see your point. And Steve Bryan, that is a real danger, isn't it, for the Conservative? It is a Conservative and Unionist yes. party. Um, but if you have lots of English people thinking, well, you know, we're fed up with these whinging Scots, yeah. their words, not mine, I yeah. hasten to add, um, let's, if they want to go off, just let them go off. There, there is that feeling, isn't there, among some people? There is. I get emails from constituents who say, uh, we want a vote in it too, so that we can vote them out. Um, but, you know, R Richard makes me laugh, you know, trying to drive through a no deal. We're trying the very opposite. You know, it, the thing about the Labour Party in Scotland is, you know, you want to make the case for the union, Richard. Instead of sitting there, you sound like the SNP that I sit opposite in Westminster every day, just complaining about the Tories and trying to badge us as Thatcherites from the 80s. You know what? We're the unionist party in Scotland. The SNP are the nationalists. And, you know, the Labour Party are standing in the middle of the road and they're going to get run over. Well, they, ha they did last general election and I predict they'll get run over. Right, the whole very quickly, what, what is the biggest danger to the union from your point of view? The who are seconds. trying to break up the most successful union in history. They're the threat to the union. And, you know, it, it, let's just say that they got their second referendum, which was once in a generation a few years ago. Let's say that they that leave, ironically, won. Then guess what would have to happen? With England, they'd then have to negotiate a withdrawal agreement where, where the discussion would well, be around money, citizens' <laughs> rights, and guess what? The border. And it would be a disaster. OK, Jürgen in Ballam, quickly 30 seconds from you, your reaction? Interesting. I mean, I think it encapsulated it quite well in that I think the biggest danger in Scotland is that the other parties keep just blaming the nationalists rather than selling a different future for what Scotland can have if they were in charge. OK, Jürgen, very good. Thank you very much indeed. More of your calls in a second. 0345 6060 It's 8.33. News headlines with Rachel Gerrish. The Prime Minister's warned the country's at a critical moment in the fight against coronavirus and threatened a second national lockdown. Hospital admissions and cases in intensive care are going up. So at the latest Downing Street briefing, Boris Johnson called for a collective willingness to make sacrifices. It says more than 7,000 people have tested positive for the virus in the UK just in the last 24 hours. Another 71 people have died within four weeks of being diagnosed. MPs have agreed to extend the government's emergency coronavirus powers by another six months. They have been promised to vote wherever possible moving forward over potential new lockdown restrictions before they come into force. Sport Newcastle have narrowly avoided a loss to fourth-tier Newport. The Premier League side scored a late equaliser before winning on penalties to reach the League Cup quarterfinals. The weather tonight, heavy rain clearing over England and Wales, taking a bit longer for Scotland though. Frost and fog patches in Northern Ireland with a low of one. Eight in the east of England. Tomorrow, a mix of sunshine and heavy showers, mostly in the southwest, and a high of 17 degrees. This is LB.
information. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Dame Louise Casey is with us. When you become a baroness, what are you going to be baroness of? Well, we're negotiating at the moment, but I think Blackstock, which Blackstock, is the Blackstock that? Road in Finsbury Park. That doesn't sound very glamorous. I think Blackstock sounds incredible. You're going to be Baroness um, Casey of Blackstock or Baroness Blackstock? Baroness Casey oh, of Blackstock. Quite right, too. Have you chosen your lordly name, Stephen? Well, there's never been a Brian in the House of Lords, so I would just be able to be Lord Brian. Uh, <laughs> Like Edwina that. Curry, I think it's a criminal mistake that you are not in the House of Lords. What would you be? <laughs> Baroness Curry of? Um, oh, crumbs. Um, probably oh, the high peak. Probably the high peak now. Oh, high peak. I mean, if, okay. the House of Lords, if the House of Lords, Ian, was in Manchester, I would be interested. But I really wouldn't want to spend my time commuting down to London to sit with 800 Mm. Sorry, Louise. Old people. <laughs> she's, she's making a lot of new friends tonight, isn't she? Yeah. Wow. Um, Don't Rick, hold back. Richard, <laughs> any aspirations to go to the House of Lords? Well, well, I, I would, of course, like to see it. I'm sorry, Louise, I would like to see it abolished and replaced with a, a Senate of the Regions, which would address some of the points that Edwina was making about people in the north of England feeling left out. I think uh, we, if right. we had greater decentralisation of power across the UK and a second chamber that reflected that, we would have much better and more effective and more representative decision-making and democracy. Right, let's go to our next question. It's from Judy in Colchester. Judy, what would you like to ask? Um, with this uh, second um, surge in COVID, what plans, if any, are in place with winter approaching for a much feared increase in homelessness and rough sleeping with the lifting of the eviction ban due to have ended on the 20th September? In my area here, already the, there is no soup run on every night anymore and the day centre is now only operating for two days, or three days a week for just two hours. A vital service at any time, but with winter approaching, it's imperative. Louise Casey. I'm actually quite worried about the winter. Um, oddly, I think that the, the management of thousands of homeless people by local authorities and the charities to get them in during COVID and the opening up of, well, it was it's about 23,000 people in the hotel um, and university accommodation and holiday parks down in Cornwall and things like that was, was really, really good. And a lot of those people are still in off the streets. Um, I worry that there's about 2,000 people that, that the government thinks is out there at the moment. And so, actually this week I was saying to colleagues in government, you need to think about what to do when we get a very, very cold snap mm. or when you get this sort of torrential rain. And I think, I think Judy, what's really difficult from a... So I went back in to help, actually, from March till about August. And I think one of the things that was is really difficult is is actually what do you leave open um, and is that safe? So right at the very beginning, obviously, Ian, it was really straightforward. I was like, right, Jonathan Van Tam, what do we need to do? And it was very clear we had to basically close down day centres, close down night shelters, because they're all communal and it would be super spreading everywhere. And that's the other issue, I think, with some of the more grassroots stuff, like soup kitchens and things like that. I mean, I came past one on the way here tonight, a regular one on the Strand, and it was just swamped yeah. with people, some of whom are on the streets, some of whom are not on the streets, but they're hungry or they're used to the lifestyle. So I think it's a, it, it's a bit fraught, this one, and I think at the moment they can't open communal night shelters and they won't be able to easily open um, things like soup kitchens and those sorts of things. So we have to go back to getting the people that are still out there into accommodation. And is it difficult to persuade some people to, to do that? Well, it was really easy in the beginning. I mean, let, let's be honest, it's like the, the, the upside of COVID and I work internationally. I was in Sydney just before I got home. And basically, in fact, there was this, this great interview with this guy and I was on at the same time. And he said, you know, the presenter said to him, so, you know, how come you're in? And he went, well, I was rounded up. And I was thinking, great. <laughs> uh, and they said, and I was stuck in this hotel. I was thinking, travel to Bristol, think I could live with that. And then he said, you know, 
but and and then eventually he said, but you know, he's getting three meals a day. He's never had three meals a day yeah. before. He's never been. Able to. So I think the I think that what what the government needs to do is just have some accommodation up its sleeve, as it were, to make sure when it gets cold, they're able to get people okay. off the street. Because Louise, the eviction span's been extended, hasn't it, till the end of March. Which, so, which there was a lot of lobbying around that, wasn't there? But there was. I mean, that was part of my frustration is sometimes it comes back to my sort of competency issue that they left it till, mm. like, the Sunday night before it was the Monday. And I'm sort of thinking, well... But at least they did it. At least they did it. At least they did it. But I think it's partly then... I think, Steve, that's where knowing what you think the plan looks like across homelessness, across um, sort of poverty, uh, food, I think is a major issue in a lot of the... You know, you shouldn't take Marcus Rashford to tell mm. everybody blah. Isn't it really about the, the more wraparound care? So, I mean, you know, it was about everybody in and now it's keeping everybody in and now we're on to the next steps, it's called, isn't it, the accommodation programme and what the, the Trinity in my constituency who are excellent and the night shelter, what they say to me is it's about, it's not just about giving people a bed or a roof, it's about the wraparound care because obviously there are so many issues that lead to homelessness, aren't there? A lot of mental health challenges, it's not just about money. Um, there are a lot of yeah. things that then lead to the homelessness and so it's about that wraparound care Completely, completely. And to be fair to the government, the Next Steps programme is really well funded. So it wasn't well funded yeah. and Rishi Shunak found some more money for it and there's a lot of support money running attached to it. But I think, you know, what Judy is saying, and I agree with her, is the problem with what we've done, Steve, is we've done a really good thing because of COVID. Yeah. It's like it's... it's. I compare and contrast what's happened around the world and what's happened on street homelessness but, but is it, really as, good, as, as but Kate, it's not a sustainable strategy for the long as term. As Kate Green might say, Richard Leonard, you, you have to take an opportunity out of a crisis, don't you? And that, and that is what certainly the Westminster government did at the beginning. What's happened in Scotland on this issue? Well, um, again, we've got an agreement from the Scottish Government that there'll be uh, no evictions until the end of March. Actually, we've said that it really ought to be extended uh, for the whole of this parliamentary session, so at least until the beginning of beginning of May. And we've made repeated calls for a no winter evictions policy, which um, has got some interest. And there's been a homelessness working group in, in Scotland which has been considering some of these ideas. But, but we've yet to see any uh, firm proposals from uh, the Scottish government on that. I think, I think we, I hope that we would all agree that there can be no going back to the way things were last winter. I mean, there has been certainly in my experience in the cities of Scotland, there has been a, a rise in rough sleeping, which has taken place over the last few years, and uh, and that's just part of a broader homelessness uh, challenge that we face. But I think we need to look at how we can address that and and what some of the long-term solutions are and and you know i have to say that um one of the consequences of the pandemic has been a rise in in poverty uh, my fear is that uh, poverty could rise even further and if people are poor they can't pay rent uh, let alone if they're in a situation where they've got a mortgage or whatever so there will be increased pressure in the housing market uh, uh, unless we can find a solution okay. to that the, 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 Edwina, the, the, uh, sorry, I, I'm going to break in, on, Richard, because we're, we're, we're running out of time on this one. Edwina, could you be quite brief, if you could? Yeah, it, it, uh, I, I have deja vu, because in 1987, we had exactly the same problem, and Margaret Thatcher said to us, it's going to be minus 10 uh, on the street tonight, I don't want anyone frozen to the street. And it ended up was my job, and that led to the Rough Sleeper uh, initiative. My own feeling is that long term, we will continue to need really good services, which also uh, are not so much to do with homelessness, but about what leads to homelessness and mental illness and PTSD and so on. Uh, and we just have to make up our mind that it's going to be long term. What you can't keep doing is putting them in hotels because we're going to need those hotels for customers fairly soon. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to more of your questions in a moment on Cross Question. It's 8.45. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, LBC. Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Alok Sharma. Isn't it fair to say that if the Prime Minister is having his trouble getting his head around the rules, it's a little unfair for the rest of us? You observe the rule of six both inside and outside. It is confusing. You'll allow that, Secretary of State. Well, what we're trying to do is be pragmatic about this. So you're completely across all the rules. So early in the morning for a gotcha question. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, weekday mornings from 7, LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.48 on LBC. Let's go to another caller. It's Rebecca in Liverpool. What's your question, Rebecca? Hi. Um, I was Hi. wondering, what does the panel think should be done to help protect student mental health at this time? And will there be greater funding for this? Um, Steve Bryan, I'm sure you've been inundated with people contacting you, students from your constituency. Um, what's your answer to Rebecca's I question? Been, I haven't, you haven't been. No, I haven't been inundated. Uh, so I have a university in my constituency, Winchester University, which is excellent. And uh, touch wood, we don't have any cases. So it would be news any... if you said it wasn't excellent. Well, no, no, but it is. Stages. It is genuinely excellent. It has a really high uh, going on to further study or going on to employment uh, rates, which I think is what it's all about. Um, and. Though I haven't had any problems there, I have had some constituents contact me to say they think it's outrageous that they're being charged the full fees um, while they're not getting the full service. And I, and I can see that argument, but as I said in the House on Monday, I think we should be very careful about that because th that pays for the lecturers, whether they're doing it in physical form or virtual form. It pays for the cleaners. It pays for you know a lot of, lot of people's employment. And we want the universities to be there in the long term. I feel desperately sorry for freshers who've gone to university. You know, I remember when I was at Liverpool University in those first few weeks you meet friends for life and uh, and they're still very close what friends happens of in now. freshers week stays in freshers week uh, i found quite right ian yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> exactly oh uh, i can see these memories flooding uh, back yeah, yeah, there. Li literally <laughs> through me um uh, <laughs> I think feel free to unburden yourself it's if you probably wish. best not but <laughs> I, I think yeah your your call is right that um rebecca is the in fact she's in liverpool isn't she, she is. yeah which is where i went to university at, at hope university rebecca and um the mental health challenge is going to be huge because you go away for the first time and then you're stuck in a room and you're doing your lectures on Zoom and all of those interactions and all that support that you get is just not there. I feel desperately, desperately sorry for them. And then to hear this thing about you may not go home for Christmas, which thankfully was debunked in the house uh, yesterday, there, were, there has to be a way found for that. Um, but no, it's um, it's a desperate situation. There's nothing nice about a pandemic, is there? There's no, no winners in, here. Indeed. And Rebecca, what, what are the mental health challenges that um, maybe you or, or friends of yours are facing at the moment? I'd say um, mainly loneliness. Um, being on yeah. your own for many hours, kind of expected to just sit in front of your computer. Um, you lose that interaction with people. And I think it's really affected people's mental health. So are you in Hall of Residence, Rebecca, in Liverpool? No, I'm, I live off campus. You live off campus, yeah. That's almost yeah. worse, though, in a way. Yeah. Um, Edwina Curry, what's your answer? Mm. Um, I, I feel for Rebecca and uh, mm. for many of the students who are facing difficulties. I mean, I think there are about 40 universities that have had outbreaks where they've uh, had to do some form of lockdown, which still leaves um, the majority. I think we've got 130 universities in Britain. So the majority have done extremely well and we should recognise that. Uh, the amount of effort that's gone into keeping students well and free of coronavirus has been astonishing uh, and that, that deserves some credit. Um, in, in the long term, Rebecca, I would say you'll come out of this much stronger. And I'm not kidding. I, I, I think of, you know, I come from Liverpool. When I was a kid, Liverpool had been flattened by the war. My parents lived through six years of that, six years. The place was bombed repeatedly. My father lived in four houses during the war, all of which were hit, including the last house, which had a direct hit and killed his father, my grandfather. And he didn't die right away. He died after three weeks of gangrene. And that generation emerged from the war, I think very damaged in many ways, but they still came out of it intact. What you're going through now is tough. It will strengthen you. It will strengthen you, I hope so. If I would say if you're entirely on your own, then you need to make more contacts. You need to make some friends. You need to have more uh, people around you. You need to make contact with your family and, and a whole host of people like that. The ones who are in hall who are locked down with maybe a bubble of nine, they're much luckier. They may not actually know each other at the beginning of the week, but they will certainly know each other in a fortnight. And that's got to be a good thing. And in the end, although this is a very, very tough year, it's actually nobody's fault. It's the fault of the coronavirus. And you really don't want to catch it. You don't want to find yourself in hospital and you don't want to give it to anybody. And we just have to be patient. And that's the quality I think we have to learn. 
Um, Richard, there have been quite a few outbreaks in Scottish University, I think particularly in, in Glasgow. Um, the, the mental health aspect of this, um, I think, is, is really important, isn't it? And it, it's something that a lot of people maybe don't give a lot of thought to, and that some people's instant reaction is, oh, well, just sort of get a grip, soldier on, and all the rest of it. But that doesn't really cut much ice if you are uh, sitting on your own um, with nobody to talk to, wondering when it's all going to end. Yeah, Ian, I think that's right. And I think that there is a, you know, Edwina said it's nobody's fault. It's just the pandemic. Well, actually, it's the role of governments uh, to anticipate these things, to listen to the advice uh, that they got and to plan accordingly. And, um, you know, we've seen, um, I think, three different pieces of guidance issued by the Scottish government over a four day period uh, from the end of last week to the beginning of this. Uh, And that guidance should have been settled and issued before students decided whether or not they were going to return to campus or not. And um, the price that these young people are paying is that they are uh, locked up to all intents and purposes in in Scotland. Uh, They were told that they could not visit cafes, restaurants or pubs last weekend. Uh, They uh, have been told not to um, uh, mix with anybody outside their own accommodation, indoors or outdoors. Uh, many of them are living in cramped accommodation, which is not suitable to to isolate in. And of course, in Scotland, Ian, uh, people will know that uh, some people start university at the age of 17. So they are extremely young, away from home for the first time uh, and put in this pretty awful s- situation. And now, of course, we're starting to see an exodus of people leaving, wanting to return home, which initially they were told uh, they weren't able to do. They can return home to the family home, although everybody then has to um, uh, go into quarantine for 14 days. But it's just such a mess which has been badly handled okay. and is unnecessarily um, putting these young people through this experience. Oh, Richard, Richard, Richard no, you no, like no, Johnny no, Hindsight. Ha, ha, you like your leader. No, okay, no, it, okay, it Steve. Four, no, we're, we're, we're running out, we're four, running out of time and I want to get one more question in. But, um, Louise, um, I... I I take account of what Richard said there about sort of cramped conditions, not seeing anybody. You you try telling a Syrian refugee that these are bad conditions and they'd laugh in your face. Well, look, listen, everybody knows that for young people, whether they're university age or whether they're younger, this is quite a difficult time. And that we know the issues around mental health for young people pre-COVID were, you know, put on the map, rightly so. And I think when we think about loneliness... I think of a lot of old people stuck in their homes shielding and I think of a lot of vulnerable people stuck in their homes. Um, I also think there are lots of people that don't have homes to be lonely in. So I think this is a really difficult thing. I feel really soft. Uh, We know that lots of people going to university for the first time really struggle without COVID. I have some sympathy for, I wish we could be a bit more planned about it. And I think now we know what those issues are. We should be doing more to support people. But I'm also partly with Edwina, which is these people had to go back to university we've got to get kids back to school the likelihood of young people dying from covid is significantly less frankly than most of us on this program this evening so you know i I think that's what i think about it but loneliness is a really people who were lonely before covid are doubly or trebly lonely now right um i'm slightly surprised we haven't had any calls this evening on uh, the trump biden debate but we have got a text here henry in tolworth asks in the aftermath of the trump biden debate who would the panel's dream president be um so you can answer that but also feel free to give me if you saw it last night give me your views but bear in mind we've got literally three minutes left so if you can be very brief um richard let's start with you Uh, Well, I actually met Bernie Sanders uh, last year, so uh, I think my vote would have been with Bernie. And I know that he's also... Uh, uh, getting on in years, but um, I think his his ideas. <laughs> it's, it's a prerequisite to be president, and, uh, and, and I think uh, <laughs> I, I would have preferred him as the candidate for the Democrats rather than Joe Biden. But I think look, that, democracy needs to be better served than it was served last night by that debate, doesn't it? I think we can probably all agree on that. Edwina, you are a mere stripling. You could easily be <laughs> president of the United States. <laughs> I'd like to see Oprah Winfrey do it. I think she'd be brilliant. She has all the style and class and TV awareness. Uh, she'd been doing that job for, gosh, over 20 years. Um, and she's a, she's a highly intelligent, great lass. And she's a real billionaire and she pays her taxes. <laughs> oh, cu- cutting comment there. Um, Louise. 
definitely not Donald Trump, obviously. Um, <laughs> actually, I hadn't thought of Oprah Winfrey, but I think she now may get my vote. I was going to say Michelle Obama, who I, I just think is such a class. You, you're, you're a great fan of dynasties in American politics, are you? We've had the Bush dynasty, the Clinton well, we dynasty, need, now need, you'd like to have an Obama We need one. the woman to do better than her husband. It, it is incredible, Steve, isn't it, that in a, in a country of, what, 350 million people, yeah. yes. they, they come up with Trump and Biden as their two leading candidates. I think it's a disgrace, and I don't know who my dream president would be, but I ha can't believe I'm going to say this, but I think it would be, I think it's time that, that I had a woman, and uh, it was all so... So think, macho. Do you think that about here? It was so macho and beep beep waving last it night. Awful. It was a disgrace. And if that's the best that they can come up with in America, then I really feel for them. But mm -hmm. I mean, the, let's be let's be clear. The real action of this election is not going to be the debates, which I don't, which I think are a waste of time anyway. It's not going to be the election. It's going to be the court battle that follows. Mm -hmm. And if Donald Trump does not get the, um, the 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 ninth person on the court, then the court is split four four. It then goes down to lower courts, and the only winner is going to be the lawyers and. That is a horrible prospect. Well, thank you to all four of you. I think it's been a really interesting debate tonight. Certainly more interesting and well-behaved than the one last night. I think we can all agree on that. Louise Casey, Edwina Curry, Richard Leonard and Steve Bryan, thank you very much. And if you missed any of it, you can catch it again on the Cross Question podcast or indeed the LBC YouTube channel. Coming up in the next hour, it's the return of the LBC Business Hour in association with O2. It's the hour where we talk about the world of business. We take your calls. Uh, we have Emma Jones from Enterprise Nation with me in the studio because she knows far more about it than I do. I do have a bit of a business background, so I like to contribute where I can. Uh, we're going to be talking about the influence of digital on business and how you can grow your business using more digital communications. Do you think that you are not doing as much as you should on that front? Give us a call 0345 6060 973. The lines are open now. That's the LBC Business Hour with Emma Jones and me, Ian Dale, coming up in a moment in association with O2. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, the Prime Minister's warning there might need to be another national lockdown if cases of coronavirus continue to rise. The UK has recorded more than 7,000 cases for the second day in a row, and another 71 people have died. Hospital admissions and cases in intensive care are going up. Speaking at the 100th Downing Street COVID briefing, Boris Johnson said the UK is at a critical moment. No matter how impatient we may be, how fed up we may become, there 